So hello, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, to what is the first of uh, eight online talks uh, for this year's uh, series of Birding 101. Uh, I'd like to extend the warmest uh, of welcomes uh, from all of us uh, here at the BTO, especially if you're new to Birding 101 uh, or if you're uh, new to the BTO. And because it's uh, the new year, uh, also a very warm uh, welcome to 2023. And I hope that you all have a fantastic uh, year ahead. Uh, so, like last year, we've got a very exciting uh, lineup of talks this year for the Birding 101. And yeah, they're split into uh, online sessions uh, and in person sessions. Uh, so, similarly to last year, today we'll be beginning with uh, kicking off with how to get started in bird watching. Uh, so, we're going to be talking about why bird watching is awesome and how you can improve your ID skills. Go on. Uh, Future sessions, uh, the online sessions. So we've got uh, one on water birds on the 17th, uh, then one on citizen science. Uh, very important uh, talk, really, how, how we as bird watchers uh, can improve conservation. Uh, one on garden birds, which will be very fun. I think we'll be learning uh, new things about uh, familiar birds uh, that we see in our gardens every day. Bird ID by sound. Uh, of course, birding is a lot easier uh, when you know uh, the songs and calls of birds, so make sure you turn up uh, to that. Uh, the seagull myth, uh, that will be on the 28th of March. Uh, so yes, of course, uh, seagulls are, are just a myth, really. There's no such thing uh, as a seagull. Uh, that will be a really interesting talk. It's a returning talk uh, from last year of um, why uh, gulls are really interesting uh, and worth your time to study. Uh, birds in the UK, so that will be a talk on the habitats that we have in the UK, the different habitats and what birds uh, you would expect to see in each one. Uh, and then the final online talk uh, this year is on migration, which will be on the 25th uh, of April, uh, focusing on migrating birds, both uh, those that spend the summer here and winter in Africa and those who uh, summer in the Arctic and in, in the northern hemisphere up north. Uh, and and winter here. So make sure you turn up uh, to all of them this year. Uh, the in-person sessions, uh, so we're going to be kicking off uh, very soon with uh, winter birding, which will be just in a few days time, and then followed by wetland birds, um, like this kingfisher here, uh, and, and birds of the sort. Then waders, which will be a new talk for Birding 101. This was a talk that wasn't uh, there last year, um, so make sure you turn up uh, to that. Waders are uh, fantastic birds really the more you uh, know about them the more you want to know more about them uh warblers uh, another new talk uh the uh, the brown jobs the uk uh, so uh, that'll be a talk uh, introducing new things uh, about these uh, underrated birds so make sure you turn up to that and that will be at the 7th of march uh, which will roughly be when uh, some of the warblers will be coming back uh, the chiff chaffs and black caps uh, especially uh the fifth session uh, will be on ethical birding so obviously when you're birding a lot we're using a lot of carbon sometimes if we're uh, going in the car uh, to go bird watching uh, and things like that and materials that we use uh, for that hobby as well so that will be um, focusing on how uh, you and, and all of us can make sure that we bird watch in a way that is uh, sustainable um, and long term uh, in thinking. Uh, the sixth session will be on seabirds. This is one that I'll be doing myself uh, on the 4th of April. I'm really looking forward to this. Seabirds are probably my favourite uh, bird group. Uh, this will be a new talk. Uh, so it's, it's something that I think all of us in the BTO are very uh, excited for. Birds in flight. So another sort of ID focused one. So uh, uh, a lot of the time, if you if you can crack birds in flight, then that saves you a lot of ID time. Um, a lot of the time when you see birds are just uh, flying away from you. So uh, that'll be a very good session to help you out when you see birds um, in that context, really, in, in flight. Uh, and then we'll be, uh, like last year, finishing with a conclusion session on the 2nd of May. Um, and I think uh, a lot of the BTO uh, personnel, youth personnel, will be going to that. So uh, make sure uh, you go to that. It should be a lot of fun, uh, just like it was last year. So as I said, today we're going to be talking about getting started into uh, starting in birding um, and how to improve your ID skills. But first of all, I think I should really introduce myself before we go on. Uh, so my name's uh, Gethin Jenkins-Jones. I'm the youth rep for Cardiff, and I have been for a couple of years now. Uh, I graduated from Exeter University uh, back in 2020. Uh, and at the moment, I'm a community uh, park ranger for Cardiff Council. 
So a lot of what I do is conservation work and groups and um, work with lots of local groups and communities, which is something that I always wanted to do uh, as a kid. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the rest of the year. So uh, that's all for me. So today's topics, what am I going to be talking about today? Well, first of all, uh, what is bird watching? Um, the simple definition and what is bird watching on a more broader sense? Why bird watching? So I'm sure a lot of you um, are into birds already if you're watching this. Um, but really, uh, if you want to get other people into birding, uh, you're gonna they're gonna want to know why bird watching is a hobby that should be pursued. So um, there'll be plenty on on why bird watching is such a fulfilling and rewarding hobby. And uh, top tips for improving your ID skills. Um, so uh, bird watching is is obviously a lot more enjoyable when you can ID birds. So uh, today I'll be uh, talking about the top tips for improving your ID skills, which will make bird watching a lot more sort of rewarding um, hobby. And when you can ID lots of birds, it also um, leads to a, sen a sense of accomplishment as well when um, you you can ID birds that you couldn't ID before. So what is bird watching? So I want you all to think now, how would you describe bird watching in a sentence? I'm sure most of you got it right. So bird watching obviously is, is looking, uh, looking at birds. Uh, I've just put it here, pursuing, observing uh, and enjoying birds. Um, so that's what bird watching is all about. Really on a, on a specific level, I, I suppose, um, or, or more the, that's more the definition of birding. But in my opinion, birding is a lot more than that. Bird watching is, is a very rich and rewarding hobby, in my opinion. And there's different ways that birding as a hobby, well, as, as an interest can be interpreted. So yes, it, it, it is a hobby. So this is an interest um, of millions of people around the world. And what makes bird watching so great as a hobby, uh, and I might be going into this later on, you can do it anywhere. You could do it in any habitat um, and you can do it in any place of the world, really. So, it, so it's a hobby that's always going around with you, wherever you are in the world, wherever you are. Uh, it's a hobby that you can always, you know, um, do uh, as opposed to other things, you know. So, for example, if you're into swimming, you need a, a swimming pool or some sea. Or if, if you're into tennis, you need a, a, a tennis court. Birding is something that will always be with you. And I think that's um, something that's very special indeed and, and not something you can say for uh, most hobbies. It's a meditation. So yes, um, bird watching not only is it a hobby, but it's also very good for our uh, physical and, and mental well-being, really. I think uh, a lot of us will say that bird watching is, is something that relaxes us and makes us a lot more happier. Um, I, I can certainly testify to that. And there's a lot of evidence out there. It's called green therapy that really celebrates and, and talks about the value of going out into green places and looking at species and, and sort of the value of that to our mental well-being. So, um, yeah, it can improve your quality of life as well. It's a science. So when we're out in nature, we can also record what we see. We can note down uh, how many species we see and what species uh, that we see around us. Uh, and then we can uh, submit those sightings online. So bird watching is also a science. Obviously, the cornerstone of the BCO really is, is science. Um, we have lots of uh, citizen, citizen surveys that uh, our uh, volunteers participate in. So really, bird watching can be a science as well. And that can be fulfilling on a whole different level because not only are you enjoying what you're seeing, but you also have that satisfaction that what you are seeing, if you will submit your records, uh, goes into science as well like, and, and can help uh, inform and um, help make uh, help decisions be made uh, to conserve our birds, which is something that is uh, very much needed at the moment. Uh, and lastly, it's an industry. So um, when you've got so many millions of bird watchers uh, around the world, then there's room for industry to grow uh, around that as well. So what am I talking about here? Uh, well, mainly uh, sort of equipment that we as birders use for so things like um, tripods and binoculars and telescopes, um, but also magazines and, and websites and things like that. There's, uh, there's definitely an industry around uh, birding. That's how sort of popular it is, really. So um, it's it's a hobby, meditation, a science and an industry. Um, so I think it's, it's, as I said earlier, it's, it's a very rich hobby with uh, lots going on. So that is just some of the reasons 
um, why this hobby is, is, in my opinion, one of the king of hobbies uh, out there. So that's what is uh, bird watching, but really why? So if you were approached uh, by a family member or maybe a friend, and they're not really too sure um, why maybe you're into bird watching or, or maybe why uh, what's stopping them from having an interest in birds? Like why, why, why should they be a birder just like you? Well, that's happened to me a couple of times. It happened to me a lot when I was a, a kid, you know, people come up to me saying, oh, what, why are you interested in nature? So I thought uh, for this one, since it's an introductory talk, to talk really about why is bird watching such an interesting uh, hobby and, and, and a great one to pursue and uh, a great hobby to try and get others uh, to pursue as well. And uh, in a single sentence, how I would uh, recommend you all reply uh, to such a question would be, because all birds are awesome. So uh, this is the swift here. So this is just one example of a British bird um, that has a, a fascinating uh, ecology. Every bird is, is, has a fascinating ecology, but I thought I'd focus on swifts uh, for this slide. Pardon me. So these are birds that are with us between, I would say, uh, early May and mid-August. And uh, the, their presence is often sort of uh, made known by the fact that they, they tend to scream in parties as, as they go overhead. Uh, this is one of my particular favourite birds, and I think it's a favourite bird to many people uh, out in Britain. Um, so what makes this bird, just as a random example, so fascinating? Well, uh, in case you didn't know, swifts do virtually everything on the wing. So they uh, sleep on the wing, they eat on the wing, they mate on the wing. Um, they have to come to old buildings and, and caves and, and crannies to nest. But except for that, they do pretty much everything on the wing which is amazing when you think of it. Just, just imagine if, if we could spend uh, just a fraction of the day, you know, being able to fly. I think most people would say that that would be the most uh, amazing thing ever. Uh, but these birds uh, do it uh, throughout their lives. And the distance that a swift can travel in a single day is something like 800 um, miles, which is something similar to the distance between John O'Groats and Land's End. So when uh, we as humans uh, do that distance, if we go um, up from John O'Groats down to um, Land's End, that, that's a big deal, isn't it? Uh, if we cycle there, if we run there, walk there, but these birds theoretically are capable of doing that every day uh, and they fly overhead and we never even think about it. Second of all, uh, because birds are beautiful. So not only are they um, awesome because of their ecology, but also because of how they look. So there's about uh, 11,000 species uh, of birds in the world. And every country really has has beautiful species. Obviously, if you go to the tropics, uh, you get a lot more beautiful species. But there are beautiful species in every country. Um, so this is the red star here, another summer migrant, uh, just like the swift. Uh, so this is a bird that's with us between sort of late April and mid-September. Uh, they're one of my personal favourites. Uh, they're not too common in Cardiff, but they are common, um, relatively common in Welsh woodlands, particularly a uh, mix of oak and hazel. Uh, and just look at the male here with its sort of orange uh, belly and, and black face and sort of uh, uh, grey back is, 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 is a really one of the, the finest birds I think certainly Wales has to offer. Uh, and uh, it's one of those birds that always quivers its uh, tail, um, which is uh, a nice giveaway. So it's, it's nice on a nice autumn day. When I see a bird flying into a bush and I just see its tail quivering nice and red and I know that's a red star um, and it can always uh, brighten your day. So yeah, this is just one of the species. If uh, I could go on, I'd be here all day because uh, most, uh, uh, well, many birds in Britain are very beautiful to look at. Uh, so thirdly, uh, because of their history, their natural history, their interactions with humans, uh, etc. So this is the red kite. And uh, I'm sure that uh, some of you at least will, will know the fascinating history that this bird has uh, here in the British Isles. So up until the uh, medieval times, uh, Middle Ages, uh, this bird would have been a common sight across pretty much all of the UK. Um, this is a mainly a sort of a scavenger. Um, so it would have been found uh, throughout the country, uh, eating sort of abandoned and, and dying livestock. Um, but ultimately it got um, severely persecuted about 200 years ago, starting about 200 years ago, 
uh, and that was definitely ex exacerbated uh, once egg collecting became a huge uh, hobby. So the population of the red kite, dis despite the fact that at one time it would have been many thousands, uh, was reduced to only about three or four birds uh, in the centre of Wales uh, around 1903. And the population stayed in Wales for a very, very long time, up until the late 80s, early 90s. Wales was the only place where you could see this bird, really. And we've done so well to hold on to it. Now I think there's about 1,100 pairs in Wales, and they all came from those one or two pairs uh, that managed to cling on. So it is a bird that's definitely special uh, to our hearts. And also, this is a sort of a uh, species that makes conservationists feel proud because it's one of those species that is a real success story. Uh, and it looks like um, the red kite, thankfully, now is here to stay. Uh, so yeah, it can really, uh, they can really make you in awe um, and definitely make you appreciate them more when you realise that, you know, just a generation ago, these birds were incredibly rare and you had to go to specific sites to see them. So uh, we are very lucky now that uh, there are many, many more places in Wales uh, where you can see these birds. Um, so we've had uh, ecology, we've had appearance and we've had history. And uh, fourthly here, we've got movements. So birds are capable of extraordinary feats uh, of uh, migratory behavior. Uh, so this is just one example, again, uh, a nice British bird. This is the Manx Shearwater. Uh, about three quarters of the Manx Shearwaters in the world breed here in the UK. So it's really, in one sense, uh, our, our national bird uh, in a way. Uh, so mostly these birds are found on islands uh, off the coast uh, of Wales, uh, Stockholm uh, Scoc and um, Scoma in particular, uh, where many hundreds of thousands of pairs uh, breed. And uh, come winter, they all leave uh, the Irish Sea and um, the North Atlantic, and they go as far south as Brazil. And you might think that, OK, many birds travel from uh, here in the UK down to the south to, to Africa and and. I suppose the seas around that. Uh, but why why pick this species? Well, the Manx Shearwaters can actually live a tremendously long period of time. They they almost live really as long as we do as humans, really. So the uh, the longest uh, known uh, the oldest known uh, Manx Shearwater uh, was something like fifty three uh, years of age. So a very old uh, age, really, for for when you compare it to most species of bird. So and they calculated that if uh, this bird was to fly in a, uh, in a single line, so to speak, throughout its life, it would be able to um, fly to the moon uh, and back nine times, which is just incredible, really, when you think about it. Uh, when, when you live for over half a century, uh, you know, and people calculate uh, how long you can fly throughout your lifetime, you know, to be able to um, say that you in theory, being able to fly to the moon and, and back nine times is just really incredible, really. When you think of the rest of us that uh, will uh, spend our lives uh, walking only a few hundred uh, miles or a few thousand miles at best. So, yeah, the movements of, of some of our uh, birds is, is really incredible. And lastly, uh, what I've chosen here is a simple blue tip because every bird, I just want to go back to my first point, every bird has a fascinating story to tell and you don't have to pick sort of the i suppose obscure ones that i've uh, picked today to really find some really interesting and inspiring facts about them so i've just picked the blue tit here so what's so interesting uh, about the blue tit well there's really many things that you could say about them so if a blue tit was to lay 10 eggs uh the female blue tit will then essentially have laid uh, her own uh, sort of body weight which is just insane really when you think about it that's the equivalent of maybe a, a mother uh giving birth to about 20 babies uh, on the trot, uh, which no human could ever do. So that's just one example. Uh, blue tits can also see in the uh, ultraviolet light spectrum, uh, and they're prolific uh, caterpillar hunters as well, because they need to be, because they need to uh, be able to feed uh, all their chicks uh, to hatching stage. So um, to get a, a brood of uh, about 10 uh, blue tits to leave the nest, uh, blue tits must uh, feed their young between 10 and 20,000 caterpillars, uh, which is just insane, really. It, it all obviously depends on how large the caterpillars are, but we're talking tens of thousands of caterpillars just to get um, their chicks out of the nest, really. So, 
you know, a very stressful uh, life for the blue tit. And many of them actually die after breeding because it's such a uh, stressful experience for them. So uh, not many uh, blue tits more, live more, longer than two or three years. Yeah, so that's just an example of a really common bird. And if I was to pick the robin or wren uh, or the great tit, I'd be able to say uh, really fascinating things about them as well. So uh, a point that I made earlier um, that is just worth saying again, uh, bird watching you can do anywhere in any habitat. So uh, I've picked here a, the wood warbler and uh, the fulmar. So the wood warbler is a bird of our uh, closed canopy woodlands and they're again uh, at their most uh, frequent in the UK and Wales. Uh, and the fulmar is a bird that um, is principally seen uh, off our coast. It's, it's been breeding in the UK now for the, for the last century or so having expanded uh, down from Scandinavia. Um, so yeah, wherever you are in the world, uh, or whether you, wherever you are in Britain, whatever sort of habitat you are, um, there's always birds to look around for. Uh, and, and that's really special, really. As I said earlier, you can take uh, um, birding uh, wherever you are in the UK. And also abroad. So obviously, um, wherever you go in the world, there will be um birds there as well so i've picked uh these three birds from different continents here so the mandarin duck is uh, a bird from the orient uh, from china uh, the wilson stone petrel is a bird that breeds off the islands of uh, antarctica uh, and uh, the knot uh, here on the bottom left is a wading bird that has most of its population breeding uh, in arctic canada in north america but the great thing about all this is that even though these three birds and many others uh, breed on different continents, uh, they can also be found in the UK. So uh, the Mandarin has, has been sort of naturalized here um, over the last century or so. Leeches storm, um, Wilson storm petrels uh, come to our seas uh, every August uh, off the coast of Cornwall uh, because they uh, migrate in a sort of lap around the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and they're not here um, winter on our estuaries and mudflats, particularly uh, in the washes uh, and North Norfolk. So it's, it's one of those great things that, um, yes, if you if you travel, you can see birds, but also the birds travel to us really. So even if you can't travel, uh, you can still enjoy birds from all the, all the, all the way around the world, really. And that's uh, really inspiring. It can also uh, improve uh, your mental health. So, uh, yes, as I said earlier, it's bird watching is meditation and it's something that, you know, can really sort of maybe relax you, particularly after uh, a week of hard work or studying. Uh, so this uh, place on the right here, uh, it's College Reservoir, which is where I went um, quite often during uh, particularly my first year in uni. It was very close to where I lived. Uh, and it was just a great place to go after some of the lectures, just to uh, hang out sometimes on my own, sometimes with other people and just uh, watching the birds there on, on, on the water there. Cormorants were particularly common uh, and they would roost uh, on the island uh, in the centre of the reservoir. Uh, and then widgeon came um, from the continent uh, to winter on the reservoir as well. So it was always nice uh, every autumn uh, seeing the, uh, the numbers there um, slowly grow. And it's just one of those things that I think is really underrated. I think... Um, uh, spending uh, spending time in nature is something that you know we should encourage everybody to do from a young age. Um, so when things can get tough, then there is that sort of coping uh, mechanism there. So yeah, I, I would definitely recommend if you are struggling to uh, yeah take a bird watching and and enjoy time in nature because it's something that can uh, help us all. So just uh, a couple of questions now, because we're going to be going on to uh, bird ID now for the uh, second part of the session. So uh, ha have a think, uh, how often do you see slash hear unfamiliar birds? And second of all, what bird groups do you find most and least challenging to identify? And I'm asking you these questions because um, sometimes, obviously, when you ask yourself some questions, you can sort of understand sort of where you're at. So uh, how often do you see and uh, hear unfamiliar birds? So for me personally, occasionally I, I do still in the UK see and hear unfamiliar birds, um, which, is, which is something that, you know, happens to every single bird watcher, no matter how uh, experienced they are, because obviously some birds that they see are, are, are fleeting glimpses. Uh, and uh, what bird groups do you find the most and least challenging to identify? Well, definitely for me, the most challenging uh, bird groups to identify is the, I would say, the rare well, the scarce uh, pipits and larks. 
Um, so uh, yeah, they're, they're definitely a group that I need to improve on uh, in the years ahead. Um, so yeah, and least challenging, maybe I would say uh, Wildfell. Wildfell can be nice and easy uh, a lot of the time if you can see them well, uh, because uh, many of them are quite unique and uh, you know, out, uh, out on the open water can make them uh, quite nice to see as well and relatively easy to identify. So if you are uh, seeing or hearing unfamiliar birds quite a lot, don't worry at all. It's something that happens to us all. And if there's one thing I could tell to somebody who's who's starting out in bird watching is you'll be surprised just how quickly, um, if you go out into the field plenty, how often, um, how quickly rather, you'll be able to clinch the ID of our most common species, really. Um, it's something that I'm definitely confident that anybody could pick up on uh, within a few weeks, certainly. Uh, because I, I think really in our cities, there's only about 40 or 50 species that uh, you're likely to see uh, for most uh, times of the year. So it's some, um, so something that, you know, shouldn't really be off-putting to you uh, if the answer is that you do see and hear uh, unfamiliar birds quite a lot. Uh, and bird groups that you find most challenging uh, to ID, yeah, mostly, I think most of you will answer that the sort of little birds can be quite hard to ID. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something that will stay with you uh, right through your sort of um, birding hobby, really, because it's uh, there are many little brown birds out there. And uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with not being able to uh, clinch their ID uh, in the early stages. Um, but if you're going out in nature, uh, one thing you're going to need uh, is equipment. So what equipment uh, should you take out in the field? Uh, well, first of all, uh, binoculars are definitely recommended. Uh, a lot of birds will be quite a few meters away from you uh, and some, you know, will require binoculars really uh, for you to ID. Not all birds will allow you to approach them um, quite closely. Um, and the good news is that um, Binoculars these days are, you know, a lot better than they were half a century ago. And if, if you go to the right places, as I will explain at the end, uh, you can get them for a really uh, cheap price or if not free with the uh, BTO equipment donation scheme, which I'll talk about later on. But generally, um, you can uh, purchase some very decent binoculars at a price, anything from, you know, £60 uh, upwards, really. So... Um, and it will definitely, definitely help you out. So these avian binoculars here, uh, they were the um, binoculars I had for over a decade. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they, they worked, uh, they worked just fine. And, you know, binoculars can also be something that can be quite sentimental as well. Um, you know, over the years when you see uh, really special birds um, with your optics, they, they, you strengthen your sort of bond almost with your equipment really. And, you know, every time you use them, then uh, you know you can get mem memories sort of flashing back, which, which is uh, which is always nice. Second of all, uh, it's a notebook and pencil, particularly if you're sort of starting off, but also if you want to just um, take note of birds you see, so you can uh, put them to uh, some of the BTO surveys when you get back. Um, so what I would definitely recommend is a moleskin uh, notebook, uh, mainly because the um, sort of the cover is nice and waterproof and the uh, paper is very uh, a very good quality. And uh, they're the type of notebook that you can just slip into your jean pocket uh, as well, trouser pockets. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely recommend you, you use that. But any any notebook will do. But as yeah, as I just said, um, ideally one you can um, put in your pocket so you don't have to bring a rucksack with you. I like bird book. Um, so, yeah, again, if you're really starting off um, and particularly if you um, saw a bird and maybe you didn't have time to know all its details down, uh, sometimes it can be nice to have a like, bird book with you in the bag so you can uh, open it up uh, and, and have a look at, you know, what birds uh, that you thought you'd have seen. As you become more experienced, um, you'll probably need this less really because you'll probably be able to uh, ID most, most um, birds just by looking at them. So it can it can be really satisfying when um, you you need to use the 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 books less really it just uh, shows how far how far you've come. And lastly, uh, a camera uh, only if you sort of uh, if if you like to. Um, so uh, yeah, if you see a bird that you're not sure of, um, of its identification, you can always uh, take a photograph of it. Uh, and you know that's that can be a huge relief uh, for you, particularly if uh, you're not sure, uh, yeah, what you're looking at. Um, taking a, a camera can be very handy, and also if um, uh, carrying a camera is something that all birders do, no matter how experienced, um, because photography is, is sort of a sister hobby uh, to bird watching. Really, it's um, 
you know, there are just as many wildlife photographers are, as there are birders, really. Uh, and it can be sort of nice ca capturing an image that you can have forever, uh, really. Uh, and uh, many birders uh, carry cameras, especially in the autumn when there might be some rare birds about. And uh, rare birds will be far more likely to be accepted um, as genuine by the Rarities Committee if, if there's a camera. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it is something that I would recommend uh, if you're starting off, uh, certainly, and, and if you have one. So how to improve your bird ID skills? Um, well, there's many ways to go about it, but I would actually um, give you three pieces of advice, three pieces of advice for anybody who's uh, trying to improve their ID skills. Uh, the first of all is uh, know what to look out for uh, when observing a bird. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm principally talking about the size, structure, coloration, behavior, and sound. So these are all the um, sort of the core uh, things of species to 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 look out for uh, when you're you're seeing them. You know, where uh, any one of these can be a huge help uh, when I trying to ID them later on. Uh, use resources. So uh, the principal resources are uh, books and social media groups, uh, but there's also websites uh, and apps as well. Uh, they can be incredibly handy, uh, and most of all, this practice being out being outdoors really really um, can enhance your birding skills um, to a degree that books can never do really. And it's not only birding, but also sort of any sort of wildlife hobby. So if you want to get into trees or bugs and butterflies and all that, learning from books is okay, but you really, uh, it really sticks in uh, the more you practice really. So uh, the more you go out, certainly the quicker you'll learn. So I encourage you all to go out uh, as often as you can. So let's um, first uh, look at size and structure. So if you see a bird and you don't know what it is, um, first of all, try and note down its shape in your head, uh, or if you have a notebook uh, with you, uh, try and note it down in the notebook. So is it long and slender or is it short and stocky? Um, so uh, this curlew uh, on the left here um, is, is quite a nice uh, slender bird um, for much of the year. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, and this robin uh, above it, I would describe as as nice and stocky. Uh, so yes, yeah, is, is the bill is it thin, thick, straight, curved, uh, long or short? So yeah, this this curlew here is a nice long curved bill, whereas the robin is is nice and short and, and um, straight. The tail is it long, short, straight, cocked, rounded or forked? Um, so as you can see, the San Martin on the bottom right of uh, this slide that has a sort of a, a short and a forked uh, tail. Um, so yeah, just this one thing to to know, uh, particularly when you see a bird in flight, try and try and know what its what its tail is like. That can be a, a, a clincher uh, for an ID. The wings uh, are they narrow, broad, uh, pointed, uh, or fingered? This is particularly um, handy with I find birds of prey because birds of prey really do have varying um, wing lengths, really, and uh, you know you can really tell um, uh, what a bird of prey is often just by looking at, um, at their wings, really, because um, also their wings sort of dictate how often they need to flap as well. So it's part of their behavior, really. Um, but yeah, bill, tail and wings are certainly things uh, you should look out for when it comes to shape. Uh, and size, how does it compare to commoner species uh, you know? So um, there are definitely some reference species I would certainly recommend. So if you're looking at a small bird, maybe compare it to a robin. Robin is quite a well-known uh, bird that is quite small. Uh, going into larger um, birds, maybe a sort of a blackbird for uh, middle-sized birds, uh, really, um, or maybe a black-headed gull. Um, so try and compare it to uh, common birds around you and, and, and yeah, note that down. So uh, the first exercise that I want you all to do uh, is to describe the structure of this bird. So this is a black winged stilt. This is a bird that does breed in the UK, although only one or two pairs a year, uh, principally in uh, uh, south um, southern Europe is, is where the nearest birds are uh, to here. Uh, and yeah, I want you to forget all about the color for the time being, and I want you just to focus on its structure. So I want you to spend the next couple of minutes uh, noting things down about how you would describe the structure of this bird uh, if you were to see it in the field.
So uh, I'm gonna go through a couple of points now. Uh, if you would still uh, feel like you'd like more time, then you can always uh, pause this video. Um, but the main things uh, I noted down uh, for the structure of this bird are its moderately long uh, straight bill. So yeah, compared to uh, some waders, it does have uh, a relatively well shorter bill if you compare it to the curlew that we just saw. But also compared to sort of other um, waders, particularly plovers, it does have sort of a, a long bill really. So it's a it's a moderately uh, long uh, bill really, sort of in the in the mid range uh, as far as waders go. Small head uh, uh, with a rounded um, and steep um, forehead. So yeah, um, this bird it, it does have quite a um, short um short head small head really particularly when you compare it to like the plovers and things like that which which uh, have got larger heads relative to the size of the rest of their body as a thin neck which is about medium medium length so yeah again plovers don't particularly have um long necks but this one has a uh, relatively uh, long neck certainly compared to them um and it's and it's quite nice and thin it's a slender body. That's certainly the case. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't describe it stocky at all. Uh, it looks very great, um, yeah, graceful, and, and and really attractive. Uh, tapered tail. Yeah, it sort of um, tapers uh, at the end. That is something to uh, take note of. Uh, the tail features, as I said earlier, uh, and uh, one thing that I hope uh, you all got. Uh, was it's extremely long legs. So yeah, it's, it's definitely uh, one of the birds. Certainly the the UK bird with the longest legs relative relative to its uh, body size. So yeah, it's, it's, it's one thing that really makes the black wings still really sort of stand out, really fantastic birds. I've only seen them um, maybe a couple in my life. And uh, yeah, I know I certainly remember the first time uh, seeing one when I was a kid, it was, it was quite extraordinary. Um, and we're going to have uh, one more uh, structure. So get your uh, pencils out again. So this is the hawfinch. So this is a different bird entirely. Um, so this is a relatively uh, rare finch. It's sort of widespread uh, across the UK, but it's, it's not really common in any one place. Uh, and it's and they're extremely shy, even though they look uh, really big and aggressive. Uh, they 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 are extremely shy and will will often fly away at the first sign of disturbance. So once again, if you can uh, pause the video or if you just want to uh, note down uh, some structural features about this bird. Uh, as a, a second exercise for structure, uh, then yeah, go ahead and um, I'll be going uh, through the points in a few moments. So the points uh, I've made, and, and remember you can always pause uh, this video if you'd like uh, more time to write uh, some structural points down. Uh, I have put down uh, is, has a very thick, heavy bill, which is certainly the case. Hawfinches are known to crack, be able to crack uh, cherry stones. They've got one of the sort of strongest bites uh, of any UK species. And certainly for the people who ring them, they always have to be sort of especially careful when it comes to these birds because they can provide quite a nasty nip. Uh, has quite a large head with little forehead. So if you think of the black wing silk just now, it did have a, a somewhat um, a straight forehead but this one doesn't really have much of a forehead at all the sort of the um the bill sort of really blends into the crown of the head um short thick neck so yeah it doesn't really have uh much of a neck at all uh, which is similar to pretty much all the finches really uh stocking barrel chested um so yeah this this bird is certainly quite plump uh, as as our little birds go and yes yeah, as, as i said uh the as a finch is, is certainly the largest and sort of stockiest uh, one that we have here in the UK. So um, yeah, very stocky. Uh, small tail uh, and legs. So yeah, this this bird does have a small tail, and it can that can almost be a feature um, that can really uh, help you clinch its ID in flight. Really, it, it's it, the shortness of its um, sort of tail. Really, uh, oops. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's it for, for the hawfinch and for the black wing silt. So if you've participated uh, in those exercises, then thanks. Um, you've just uh, helped to improve your own um, ID uh, skills by um, taking note of, uh, of the structure. Uh, so yeah, staying on structure, why have I started with structure? Because I think some of you might think that we would start with color, uh, or rather plumage, uh, the color of the plumage. Well. Structure is something that is constant throughout the year, even though plumage might change. So we've got three birds here. Um, and as you can see, the top photographs uh, are very different to the ones 
uh, on the bottom in terms of, of what the birds look like. So on the left, we've got the black-headed gull. Uh, on the bottom, that's what the bird looks like uh, in summer, uh, with a not really black head, but more of a brown head. Um, uh, but the bird on the top is, well, again, black-headed gull, but what they look like uh, in winter. So you can see that, um, you know, they, you would almost uh, be forgiven to think that they're different species because, you know, the, the, the colours are very different. But the structures are, are very much the same, really. Uh, and that's definitely the case for the next two birds. So the bird in the middle is the little green. Um, so the one on the top is what the birds look like uh, during the summer uh, with a nice bit of red um, below the eye. Uh, whereas the one on the bottom is uh, a lot more sort of drab uh, appearance really to it. Um, so yeah, uh, again, sort of a, a, a different appearance for different times of year. And the bird on the right here is the uh, black-tailed godwit, uh, which is a wading bird uh, here in the UK. Uh, it does sort of breed. It breeds uh, sort of in, in, in Scotland, um, Orkney and, and Shetland, uh, but most of our um, population uh, comes from Iceland uh, and, and the continent, really. So the uh, photograph on the bottom is what the bird looks like in summer, so a really nice vibrant orange, whereas the birds that we typically see in the UK are... Uh, as the bird looks like uh, on the top, really sort of um, sort of a more sandy colour, uh, which is what the birds look like uh, in winter and autumn. So yeah, the, the, that's the reason why I started with structure first, because I think that structure is more important than plumage, because as I said, structure is something that is constant, whereas plumage uh, can change um, from one season to the next. Behaviour as well. Uh, so behaviour can be uh, a really big giveaway uh, of a species ID. So is the bird solitary or social? So uh, we can see the widgeon here on the, on the top. So these are birds that are very, uh, very social um, ducks. Really, you more often or not see them um, in groups. Whereas the other birds, um, as you can see, the grey wagtails and dunnocks, they don't really flock so much. You might see the grey wagtails in, in in family parties in in late summer, but really they're they're far more sort of solitary. They don't really flock as such. Um, movements: Do they wag or bob, walk or hop? So yeah, back to these birds. So the uh, grey wagtail uh, wags its tail, uh, just like the uh, pied wagtail and and yellow wagtail, the other two wagtails of the UK. And the, the great thing about this is no, nobody knows why they wag their tails. It's one of those ontological mysteries. Uh, there have been some theories. Uh, so some think that they sort of try and blend in with the movement of the water. So they uh, don't, uh, they're not too um, obvious to predators. Uh, and some other people think that is because they, while swagging their tail, flush insects, uh, which they can then hunt. But yes, yeah, it's something that uh, nobody's sure quite why they do it. Uh, and yeah, some some birds uh, walk and some hop. So uh, birds like um, the dunnock here, they they don't walk, which is incredible um, when you think about it. I think most people think that all birds walk, but some of them just hop. So uh, yeah, try try imagining hopping for the rest of your life, and you're one step closer to being like a dunnock. And flight uh, pans as well. Yeah. So as I said earlier, with the wings, um, yeah, do they flap their wings constantly, or do they fly in bounces, and do they glide? So yeah, the birds that typically have uh, longer wings, they don't really need to flap as often. Um, so this marsh harrier here uh, at the top, uh, when you see that fly, that bird won't have to flap his wings as often, for example, as a sparrowhawk, which is a lot um, uh, shorter wings. Uh, yeah, do they fly in bounces and do they glide? So yeah, uh, the grey wagtail here on the right, uh, those are birds that sort of bounce, they sort of fly up and down really rather than uh, in a straight line. Um, so yeah, uh, behaviour is a huge, um, uh, can be a huge help uh, when IDing birds really. So always note down not only what the bird looks like, but also what the bird is doing. But there's no denying it. Uh, obviously, plumage is very important. So it, this is something you should also be noting down. Um, so there's, there's no really big rule about it. I would say that the first thing you should do is, is note down where the colours are most obvious, really. So um, note down if there's any sort of vibrant colours um, that the bird have. So uh, these birds here at the top, uh, their structure is very similar, but their plumage is very much different. So the bird on the top left is the turtle dove, whereas the bird on the top right is the collar dove. Um, both uh, species you can see here in the UK, the turtle dove only in the summer, uh, the collared dove uh, throughout the year, 
uh, although the turtle dove you can only really get them in the um, uh, southeast these days. Um, so yeah, as you can see, the turtle dove has a far more sort of vibrant mottled um, plumage than the than the collar dove here, which which is quite plain. So yeah, no, no down any sort of vibrancy. Um, uh, where where uh, vibrancy in the plumage, if there is any. Uh, yeah, so uh, patterns, is it mottled or plain? Does it have any spots or stripes? So the if we look at the birds of prey on the bottom right here, uh, we can see that the sparrowhawk is sort of horizontal stripes across its belly, whereas the peregrine on the bottom left is, is more sort of streaking down. Uh, so yeah, do note um, if there are any spots or stripes. And what colouring do the following have? So yeah, if, if you're sort of not too sure if, if the bird doesn't have any particular vibrant colours, but you you know you need to note, note things down, I would recommend you look at the bill first. Uh, if does the bill have any colour? Uh, do the legs have any particular colour? Uh, the head and the belly, really. And uh, yeah, I would certainly recommend you um, note down as many colours as you can, really, obviously. So the, the more colours you have, um, the more sort of evidence you have really and, and the more information you have when you then go back to id um so yeah be as specific as you can and, and if you have time in your notebook you can always uh, draw a nice sketch as well uh, in pencil or maybe even if you have um, colored pencils so yeah it's something that i used to do uh, quite often as a kid so i've got an exercise uh for you now um so uh what i want you to do i want you to get your uh uh, notebook and pencil out again because we're going to have a coloration uh, exercise because quite often in birding uh, you will see a bird but you only see it for a few uh, seconds uh, before it disappears again so this is the exercise that we're going to be doing now um, so if you're all ready I want you to note down as many of the uh, coloration uh, plumage um, features of this bird uh, and I'm going to give you about 10 seconds uh, before uh, then uh, discussing um, uh, the plumage uh, of the, this particular bird afterwards. So here we go. Not long, isn't it? So often that's really the, the, the case with when it comes to birding. So uh, often you won't see birds for very long at all, particularly uh, when they're sort of moving about a lot. Uh, which happens a lot in the morning when they when they typically feed. Uh, glimpses of birds can be very uh, sort of fleeting. So really in, in your head, you have to sort of note down uh, as many things uh, as you can really. And try and always visualize what the bird looks like when you shut your eyes. So if you don't have time to um, note, note everything down, uh, at least you can have some sort of residual memory and you'll know what to note down when you go back, um, back home or, or back to your notebook. So uh, this bird is the chaffinch. So this is one of the commoner birds uh, of the UK. So as you can see, it's got a, a very nice sort of silvery uh, bill here. Uh, it's got a um, sort of bluish, greyish um, head and sort of nape. And nape is the area of the back of the neck. Um, I would describe uh, its back as mainly sort of brown, brownish, rather than its um, belly, which is, I would say, more sort of orangey, orangey brown. Um, and it also has a that same color for its cheek as well and the wings i'm not going to go um, to the specific features uh, of the wings there are different uh, feathers in the wings i've decided not to sort of go uh, go through them today i, th I think um, uh, they will be covered uh, plenty in the talks that are to come um, but the shoulder patch of this bird you can really see that is sort of blue at the top uh, and then uh, sort of white below but the um, what I would note down um, if if I was used is uh, the wings of this bird are a mixture of sort of greys and, and blacks and whites. So it's got like a, a nice um, a couple of wing bars uh, to this bird. Um, sort of brown legs. Uh, that's that's the color of the legs of this bird. And uh, the vent, which is sort of the the bottom of the bird, uh, is is a pale. Um, cream or, or even white really so there's plenty of things going on uh, for this uh, bird here and is again one of the um, like the red start one of the more uh, sort of attractive birds that we have in the UK so yeah it's, it's one of those uh, birds that have a, a rich um, blend of colours that you know uh, will definitely keep you occupied uh, when you're noting them down 
So uh, finishing off now, so uh, we've gone into um, sort of how to ID birds, but just going back on sort of resources, um, what you would need, uh, what I would recommend you have when you start on bird watching, uh, certainly books is one of them. And uh, there isn't any sort of um, one particular book. I'd say probably the best book would be Collins Bird Guides, although that book covers Europe as well, rather than just Britain. Uh, I would definitely recommend uh, that book. Third edition has recently come out. Um, but certainly if um, you want a book just on Britain and Ireland, then I would definitely recommend uh, you read uh, the Britain's uh, Bird uh, Guides, uh, the, the RSPB, uh, the Wild Guides, um, uh, Britain Bird Book. Uh, because one of the great things about this book is that uh, it shows the birds, if you look at the picture on the right here, uh, of birds in uh, positions that, um you're likely to see them um out in the field so uh often these sea ducks yeah you'll you'll see them flying just as often as you'll see them on the sea and it's always nice uh, when you compare them to um uh, other species really so you can definitely um compare the sort of stru size and structure um of the different birds so yeah it's, it's one of those books i would recommend i do have um quite a few guides uh, by wild guides um i've also got one on on fish and uh and mushrooms as well I, I believe so yeah definitely one of those books i would recommend um but yeah uh, also colin's bird guide uh, as well uh certainly um that book first came out in the late 90s and it's it's possibly one of the best uh, bird id books um out there i would say Online resources as well. So we're very lucky in the age of the internet really to have even more um, sort of resources uh, on the internet, well, uh, out there uh, that can help you uh, ID birds. So um, on the right, I'll start on the right, there are groups that can help you out with bird ID. So if you have a photograph or maybe a description of a bird and you're not quite sure about it, I would definitely recommend you go on the UK Bird Identification uh, Facebook page. One of the great things about um, this Facebook page is that people uh, tend to reply quite quickly uh, and also uh, for the large part, they're quite polite as well. So even if you, uh, you know, think that you've seen a very common species, uh, no problem at all, put it on there and um, yeah, just join the community because it's, it's quite a popular, uh, popular Facebook page. And uh, in the past, um, some very rare birds have been put on there by people who didn't know that they were seeing rare birds. I remember particularly a couple of rare thrushes uh, being put on there a few years ago. So you never know if you find something rare, you know, you could help uh, other people uh, see that bird if you, you know, put it online. Uh, and on the uh, left here, we've got the identification videos uh, on the BTO uh, website. Uh, so yeah, um, there are some uh, videos on YouTube and, and accessible on their website as well that can really help you uh, ID birds. So uh, yeah, do, do check out uh, both the website and the Facebook page. Uh, but as I said earlier, the best thing to do is practice really. So a challenge for you guys, is to create yourself a local patch. So this, uh, these two photographs from the top head, this is my local patch. Uh, so this is Forest Farm uh, Nature Reserve, which is actually where I'm based uh, as part of my work. Um, and on the top right is a photograph of me from when I was a little kid, just all walking along uh, in the snow. And it's, it's nice creating a patch because you can create yourself little sort of challenges you can do. So one thing, um, I would do quite a lot is yeah see how many uh different birds I can see there you know in in one day and and in a one year um for example um and also sort of note down what common species there are so um you know when you when you go to your local patch multiple times you 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 see a pattern of the type of birds that you see you get quite familiar with the birds uh, in, in your patch so um for most patches there are some birds that will be common on your patch, which are more scarce as elsewhere, but might be common elsewhere, but really rare on your patch. So for example, um, for my particular patch, I don't think a coot has been seen in Forest Farm for about 15 years. So even though, you know, they're, they're very common birds, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're super rare uh, on my patch. And, you know, that that sets like a bar of sort of excitement, really. Once once you know what birds are sort of common, which ones are are not common uh, on your patch, it really gives you a sense of, uh, you know, um, appreciation and luck when you do then see those rarer birds. 
so yeah, uh, if I were you, um, find yourself maybe a local patch, and yeah, I, I would I would give yourself like a nice little challenge. It's the start of the new year. Um, you could give yourself a challenge of how many different birds uh, you can see within this particular area, and then next year you can see uh, if you can see even more, and that will sort of prompt you to go out and and go out even uh, even more often uh, to observe them. Uh, so yeah, definitely definitely practice. Uh, going uh, on to uh, what I said uh, earlier about um, the BTO's equipment donation scheme and sort of binoculars and things like that. If you don't have a pair of binoculars and you don't think you'll be able to afford uh, a pair, then do not worry at all. If you're under the age of 21, then you're more than welcome to take, uh, you know, take part in the uh, BTO's equipment donation scheme. So this was a scheme that was set up a couple of, uh, couple of years ago, two or three years ago, and it's been very successful. Uh, so many of our sort of fan, um, volunteers uh, have donated equipment to us, uh, and then we give that out to uh, young people uh, such as yourselves uh, who want to start um, a hobby in bird watching. Really, so if you uh, don't have a pair of binoculars, or maybe you'd like some books or other things of the sort uh, to get you started, then do contact the BTO because uh, they uh, might help you out and then you know you, you can have them definitely then uh, but you know uh, if if you want to borrow them you could always uh, give them back but really this is a sort of a donation scheme it's it's, it's something that uh, we're really proud of here in the BTO BTO youth have started really we've we've been able to you know help and inspire dozens and dozens and dozens of young birders out there and I really do hope that um, this scheme continues so yeah do check out the equipment donation scheme uh, if you would like um, some equipment. So just uh, finishing off uh, quickly about what the BTO is really, I've decided to keep this uh, to the end because I really wanted to focus all this talk really on, on ID to, to sort of help you out. But I thought it would be nice to, to give a, a couple of things about the BTO um, here at the end. So the British Trust for Ornithology is a non-campaigning organisation um, with the main aim uh, to protect, uh, well, monitor and protect our birds, really. So how do we do this? Well, this really comes uh, down in the form of surveys. So we've got um, a select, uh, about half a dozen core surveys, uh, which is our sort of main effort really here in the BTO. Half a dozen surveys that you know we we sort of prioritise uh, really and and have a, a large database for uh, over the last few decades. So those are, uh, for example, wetland bird survey, bird track, um, the nest record scheme, breeding bird surveys. I'm not going to go into detail about them, but if if you'd like to check them out, certainly um, bird track and the wetland bird survey you can uh, you can do with almost minimum experience bird watching. So if you would like to take part in the BTO. Uh, surveys then yeah do check out their website and as I said earlier if you're helping the BTO out in their surveys then you also get that satisfaction that you know you're helping science as well which is what we what we want in at the end of the day so yeah bird populations are estimated uh, from volunteer survey data uh, helping to recognize species of concern so yeah certainly over the last few years um the work that the BTO has done uh, the, vol the volunteer surveys uh, that that the volunteers do um, have really flagged up some really rare or rather really threatened and declining uh, species, particularly, for example, the plight of, of birds such as such as the turtle dove. So, um, yeah, uh, the, the BTO is incredibly, incredibly important um, because uh, many of our birds now are uh, and have been under threat for a while. So it's really, really important that we know where those birds are, how many of, the, are, how many of them are there. Uh, and how their population is doing really so um yeah um the, we need more uh, charities uh, like bto uh, for all groups of life really uh i recommend that you all uh, follow the bto so the bto um uh, has a few social media pages so yeah at, at bto at twitter uh, we also have a facebook page uh, that i would recommend that you all um check out uh, and at BTO Birds uh, on Instagram as well. So um, yeah, there's there's plenty of opportunities to find out and to see what the BTO are doing, uh, and updates on birds and things like that. An update on on sort of the reports and 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 the surveys that we do um, that the volunteers do at the end of the year. So we do the volunteer uh, the volunteer work, and then you know they they let us know the the sort of the results of that. And it's always nice seeing sort of graphs and things like that um, of of how our birds are doing, particularly uh, if they're increasing. 
So yeah, if uh, you would like to know uh, more about the BTO and if you'd like to join the BTO and, and you're a youth, maybe you'd like to get involved in the BTO's uh, equipment donation scheme, then yeah, do check, uh, then do go on our website and uh, yeah, go on www.bto.org slash youth reps if you'd like to know more about the youth personnel as well. Um, so youth reps, uh, we are based across the UK really. So um, most most people, I hope at this point, uh, aren't, aren't too far away from their uh, nearest BTO youth rep. And as B as reps, we really want, uh, are here for you. We we really want to help help you guys out on your journey uh, into becoming uh, sort of a a bird that can that can help uh, the BTO out and other organisations and and really just uh, you know uh, shepherding you on to a really uh, you know a long term and and, and rewarding hobby. So. Um, yeah, we're always happy to help out sort of, um, you know, leading one to one walks and things like that and introducing uh, young people to sites uh, and things of the sort. So do check out uh, our website and do keep in touch. And lastly, uh, thank you. So uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed today. Um, but the real excitement, I think, is when uh, future sessions uh, that are coming up, which are going to be in person. So there's going to be a lot more activities and events and a lot more sort of discussion and, and questions uh, that you guys can answer. Um, so, yeah, do check out uh, all the sessions that are to come this year. Again, if you would like to know uh, when the sessions are and, and who are chairing them, then do go on to the BTO uh, website. So, yeah. Uh, a thank a big thank you uh, from me and um yeah i hope to see you all um in the sessions to come particularly uh, i suppose the uh Cibers one which i will be doing so uh yeah i hope you've enjoyed today i hope you've taken um a couple of things out of this uh this this session here today of, of how to improve your id so uh yeah go find a, a patch guys and uh hopefully i'll see you real soon uh take care